رزقنا من اعوانه و انصاره This is the second in a series of talks on aqaid. We are going to further talk about the concept of tawhid. In the last session we said that tawhid is very important and a proper understanding of tawhid can affect any area of life and can form any aspect of human thought. And then we just mentioned something so that we can build upon it today about different dimensions of Tawhid. Normally, scholars of Aqidah or Mutakallimun or theologians divide Tawhid into the following categories, or classify Tawhid into the following categories. One is Tawhid in respect to divine essence. It is what we call Tawhid Zati or Tawhid Fazat, which means that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is one, and this means to reject any idea of having partner or parts. Neither he has partner nor he has part. It's one reality which accepts no division and which accepts no multitude. And this concept of unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is different from unity of the things that we normally talk about. Normally, when we say something is one, it means one from a class of similar things. For example, I say there is one microphone here. It means that there is no second or third, but there is possibility of having second or third. If we have one person in a room, we say there is one person. But this doesn't <clears throat> mean that there is no possibility of having second or third. When we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say he is one, it doesn't mean that it could be two or three or four, but we have just have happened that we have just one. Maybe in future we could have more. No, this is not the concept of Tawheed. In the case of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we talk about his oneness, it means that he is one and no second can be conceived. No second can even be imagined, let alone come to existence. Like what? For example, if you consider absolute concepts, like whiteness, you can have different white objects, white paper, white clothes, white car, different things. But what about whiteness? Whiteness as such admits no second or third. You can only imagine one whiteness, because if you want to have two, then you need some difference. Whenever you have two or three or more, you must have something on which you can say that this is different from the other. You have two books. Okay. One book must be different from the other. If they are from every aspect the same, so how can you say there are two books? Whenever you talk about two or three or four, you need some similarity and some difference. You say two apples. Okay, they are similar in being apple, but they must be different in shape, in weight, in taste, or at least in existence. If you can even, for example, have two apples which are similar in every aspect, at least in their existence they are different. They occupy different spaces. This is different from the other. You can refer to this 
and at the same time not refer to the other. But <clears throat> when you talk about whiteness, can you imagine two whiteness? Whiteness as such is the same, always the same, it's only one. Or for example, <clears throat> you talk about human beings. Human beings are different. But the concept of humanity, <clears throat> humanity as such, is it one concept or two concepts? It's one concept. Humanity as such. And you cannot have two, three, four of the same concept. You can add something to humanity to produce different concepts. For example, you can say humanity plus gender. So we have male human and female human, for example. Or, for example, according to the age. Maybe young, maybe old, maybe middle age. But if you are just thinking about humanity, the concept of humanity, then it doesn't accept two or three or four. So this is why Muslim philosophers say that whenever you have some absolute concept, means something without addition, it doesn't admit multitude. It doesn't admit secondness or thirdness. This is the type of understanding that we should have about unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is one in the sense that no second can be thought, no second can be imagined. It's not just that it doesn't exist. Okay? So, this is not a numeric sense of oneness. This is much more than numeric oneness. This is Tawheed in respect to divine essence. So he is one. No part, no partner. The second thing which is maybe more difficult is Tawheed in respect to divine attributes. Tawheed in respect to divine qualities. Before I mention this type of Tawheed, I should say that we are really in difficulty when we want to talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we want to think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you always are dealing with creatures, with the things which are limited. Indeed, our language is most of the time geared towards limited things. For example, when I talk about knowledge, as soon as I say knowledge, what kind of knowledge comes to your mind? Human knowledge comes to your mind. Someone who learns, who tries to memorize, who may forget, whose knowledge may be mixed with illusions, with errors, who has a mind and uses concepts. This, this is what you, uh, comes to your mind. You need to refine the concept of knowledge and remove all the deficiencies so that you can get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge. When I talk about power, what kind of power comes to your mind? Normal types of power which are familiar to human beings. Power of muscle, or power of machines and engines, or power of animals, like horse, for example. This kind of <clears throat> power comes to your mind. But you need to refine the concept of power and remove all the deficiencies, all the normal and popular means of creating and generating power and just imagine the ability to do something. Whether it is through muscles or engines, no. It's not part of the concept of power. <clears throat> Whether it is a person who is learning to increase his power or not, this is not the core of the concept of power. We should remove all these things. Only in the end, what remains is the ability to do something that he wants. A person is powerful when he can do what he wants. Okay? So, 
When we talk about divine attributes, we must be very careful, otherwise we would suffer anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism means likening other things to human beings. And in this case, likening Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to human beings. This is very dangerous. Unfortunately, in religious traditions, even in Islam, we have had people who had some kind of understanding of God. Sometimes even you read in some hadith, in Saha, that they talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he has some body, some physical body, and they liken Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to a human being. You have also in the Bible about God wrestling, you know, with some of the prophets and this kind of understanding of God. So it's because the mind is not equipped with a kind of philosophical understanding of God and his qualities. So they just try to liken Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to human beings. Anyway, having said this, still there is a great deal that we can learn. Imam Ali alayhi salam has a beautiful saying. He says, لم يطلع الأغول على تحديد صفته ولم يحجبها عن واجب معرفته. He says Allah subhanahu wa taala has not made intellects, human intellects, aware of all details of his qualities. They cannot exhaust. The qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at the same time, Lam Yahjubha and Wajib Ma'rifate. Allah has not deprived human intellects from understanding what is compulsory, what is necessary. So it means that we can understand to certain limit, but it's not that we can understand everything. We can understand certain things. Okay. Tawheed in respect to divine qualities means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has qualities which are not different from himself and from each other in existence. This is very important. Allah's qualities, I repeat, are not different in existence from himself or each other. They are only different in concepts, not in reality. For example, when we talk about Allah's knowledge, and then Allah's power, and then Allah's life, Allah's will, Allah's love, are these different beings so you have one God who is only the essence of God and then next to it something as knowledge and then something as power, something as life, as will. The way that some early Muslims have thought. Some early Muslims, of course, uh, not from the school of Ahlul Bayt, they had the idea that there are eight eternal beings, eight eternal beings. One is Allah's essence and then seven qualities. And because they knew that the qualities cannot be created, so they believe that all those qualities are eternal and independent, which is shirk. Because in the end, you come up with eight God, eight things which are not created and exist from the eternity. This is wrong. We have only one God who is not created. These qualities are different, but only different in our understanding, in our conceptualizing the same reality. So it's one reality from which you abstract different concepts. So you say, 
this reality must have knowledge. This reality must have power. This reality must have will. This reality must have life. And so on and so forth. Why? For different reasons. If he didn't have knowledge, how he could have created the whole world? And the same about power, if he didn't have power. If he didn't have will, so it means that someone else must have forced him. Who is there to force him? There is no one else who can force him. If he has no love, so why he is giving? So we can argue for all these qualities and prove that he must have such a quality. But in the end, we must know that it is only one being, one reality with different qualities. This is even more subtle, more precise than unity of a person in human being. Because you may say, oh, oh, Molana, this is not something very important. Even in human being, we have one person with different qualities. The same person who is, for example, a man, who is, a, for example, Muslim, who is, for example, uh, a doctor or engineer or teacher. At the same time, he may be a father. At the same time, he may be son of someone. At the same time, uncle. At the same time, cousin. So one thing with different qualities. So some people may think that this is the case about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, this is good. You can use this as an example to come closer. But this is not enough. Why? Because in our case, if we look carefully, we are not really one unit. We are not one unit. We are one reality with many, many extra badges and additions. My knowledge is not the same as me. In other words, in my essence, I may not have this knowledge. I acquire this knowledge. This knowledge may come and go. If my knowledge was the same as my very existence, so I didn't need to learn, and I always could remember. My power is different from me. My power is subject to changes, to increase or decrease, or even loss. I may lose all power. Sometimes you may not even be able to speak few words. The easiest thing in this world may be to speak. But there are cases people cannot speak. So our qualities, after careful assessment, are not identical with us. They come and go away. But in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is different. You have really one unit. If you think days and days, weeks and weeks, and find, try to find any combination, you cannot find anything. There is no combination, no mixture in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Absolutely one. In Arabic, there is a poem which is very beautiful. It says, Ibaratuna shatta wa husnu kawahidu wa kullun ila zaka al jamal tushiru. Maybe someone said this initially for his beloved, or maybe initially was said about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't know, but anyway, we can use it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever the intention of the person was. It says, Our Expressions are different. Salam. Our expressions are different. But your beauty is one. And all different expressions refer to the same beauty. 
some people call it God, some people call it Allah, some people call it Khuda, some people may call it other names. But all these different expressions refer to the same reality. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even in the same religion, you have different qualities. Inshallah later we'll talk about names and attributes of Allah. You say Allah, you say Rahman, you say Rahim, you say Qafar, whatever you say, you refer to one reality, one being. So this is unity in respect to divine attributes. All the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the same in their existence. They are different in our understanding. They re in other words, they refer to different aspects of the same reality. None of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are accidental or additional to his essence. There, was, there has been no time that Allah didn't have these qualities and then he acquired them. It's impossible. How is it possible? That Allah lacks knowledge, then he acquires knowledge. Where does he get knowledge? If he doesn't have in the first place, how can he go and achieve knowledge? It's impossible. Without having something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot achieve it. Because there is no source, there is no market, there is no uh, supplier other than himself. So whatever he has, he has. The third aspect of Tawheed is Tawheed in respect to divine acts. What does it mean? It means that everything which happens in this world is an act of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever we do, whatever other human beings do, whatever animals do, whatever happens in the environment, in the nature, Everything is an act of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there is no other source of power, no other source of creation. Nothing else can influence the world which belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only time we could have thought that there may be other doers is if we had two, three, four gods, then everyone in his own territory could have done something. But we have only one God and one world which is very consistent, and which is very interrelated, interwoven. And this is one of the reasons for unity of Allah. If there were two or three gods, then there could have been endless fight between the worlds which belong to these gods. Everyone with his territory, would oppose the other one. And there could be no interaction between these two territories. Don't tell me, you know, sometimes two countries live peacefully. No, this is different. Because if two worlds are created by two gods, it's philosophically impossible to think of any interaction. Because every world is under his Lord, under his creator, and there is no way that they can get connected to the other one. If I want to give you an example, which is not a perfect example, just to help. The ideas which are in your mind totally depend on you. The ideas which are in my mind totally depend on me. For example, you imagine a car in your mind. Okay? Just imagine a car in your mind. I imagine a car in my mind. The car in my mind cannot hit the car in your mind. I can imagine a car that belongs to you and hit my car. But this is both cars belong to me. But a car in my mind cannot hit the car in your mind. There can be no interaction. The example about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is much more 
fewer than this, but just to give you some idea that how, if we had two gods with two worlds under them, there could have been no interaction. It's impossible. But this is not the case. We see that this world is totally interrelated. So, we have one God, one world. Whatever happens in this world is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even the bad things that we do, without giving any legitimacy to them, without giving any recognition to them, still we must accept that these are creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but through a human being who has been given freedom. I freely decide to do something. We all freely have decided to come here today. Okay, so this is our action. We don't deny that. We cannot reject that. We must be fully responsible for what we do. But at the same time, we should know that it was not me, independent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who has been able to do this. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will and power and blessing that has made us able to come here. Even sometimes we do something that Allah is not pleased with. Sometimes we disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But still, what we do is only because Allah has given us such a power, such ability. Allah has enabled us to disobey him. Why? Because this is the concept of test. If we were not able to disobey, and then we would have always obeyed, this is not a big virtue, this is not a big credit. Allah has enabled us to obey or disobey. Whether we obey or disobey, it's because of his power and will. Some people decide to obey, some people may decide to disobey. In both cases, they cannot say that I have done what I have done independent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here we should distinguish between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's legislative will and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's generative will. Generative will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everywhere. Whatever we do must be preceded by a generative will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-irada at-takwiniya. Means Allah must have permitted this to happen. But some of the things that we do are preceded by Allah's legislative will and some are not. If I do something good according to Allah's legislation, so Allah's legislative will is with me. If I disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have acted against Allah's legislative will, but in both cases, I have always acted according to Allah's generative will. So no sinner can think that he has defeated Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his power. No one can be defeat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the sinner is not pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's like you giving some money to your child and you say him to tell him go and buy some for example books some good f food and never buy cigarette or you know something you know harmful and i'm going to watch you and see what you are going to do if you buy book or something useful, I will reward you. If you buy something harmful, then you would be held accountable. Okay, you give the money to the child, the child goes to the shop, you see him, oversee him, what he does, but you don't stop him if he does something wrong. You just want to see and check. Whether he buys a book or cigarette, it has been your will to give him such chance to try him. But if he buys book, 
he has your extra blessing. If you buy cigarettes, he has had your permission, some kind of will from you, but not pleasure of you, not blessing of you, in the sense that you were happy with this. So this is more or less something similar to what is our relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whatever happens in this world is an act of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, first of all, relates to the creation of this world. But it's not only the creation of the world. Some people think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the world and then there is no further creation. They think that creation has happened once. But in reality, creation is an ongoing process. In every moment, the world is being created. It's like a river. When you look at the river, you think that the water is the same water. But it's not the same water. It's flowing and always fresh water is coming. When I'm talking to you, you think that I am the same creature that I used to be. And I think that you are the same creature. But indeed, in every moment we are being created. But because of continuity, we say this is the same thing. And it's really the same thing. But this only a matter of continuity. We are always being created. If for a moment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't create us, we cease to exist. Allah doesn't need to destroy. Just the fact that he doesn't want us to be there is enough not to be there. Again, if you want to understand it, you can think about your own mind. Imagine a flower in your mind, a rose flower in your mind. Okay, now this rose flower is there. This rose flower is totally dependent on you. The moment you think about something else, it goes away. You don't need to send someone to take out the rose flower from your mind and put it in the bin. As long as you pay attention, the rose flower is there. If you stop paying attention, that goes away. This is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates us. As long as he pays attention to us, we are there. If he doesn't want us to be there, that's finished. So there is no need to come and destroy us. So creation is something which is going on and on. As we have this beautiful sentence, كل يوم هو في شأن. Every day, every time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing something. He's always in charge and he's always doing something. Allah never retires. Allah never goes for some holidays, you know, and say, okay, for a few days, everything should stop. I'm going for some holidays. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always creating and generating. If we have such a concept of creation, then it would be impossible to think that there may be some actions which do not belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever happens is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, let me stop here. I want to have some questions. And inshallah, in the next session, we will talk further about uh, some of the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and some other aspects of Tawheed. And in particular, inshallah, we will talk about issue of justice which is one of our principles of our faith about divine justice. Inshallah, we'll talk about it. And some of the questions which may come to the mind about justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Allahumma shalala wa alhamdulillahi wa alhamdulillahi wa alhamdulillahi Thank you very much, Sheikh. Yeah, Inshallah, we have about five minutes for questions. Can I yeah. take the first question from the ladies, please? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Um, even though Allah has 99 Asma al Husna, why is it that we call him mainly with the name of Allah? Yeah. 
the, the question is that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has al asma ul husna the best names why we normally call him Allah this is what inshallah we talk about it in next session but briefly Allah is the name which refers to the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala an essence which has all the perfect qualities Rahman is also thought to be the same but other names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refer to some quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not the essence whenever for example you say Rahim you say Qafar you say Shadid al Azab you say for example Alim whatever Khalaq you are referring to one quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but when you say Allah you refer to the essence which has all these qualities as we say in Arabic we say zatun mustajma'un li jami'i sifat al kamal means an essence which has all the qualities of perfection so there is a difference between names of essence and names of qualities although as i said they all refer to the same realities the same being but it's a matter of how you approach. Sometimes you may call a person by his name, personal name. Sometimes you may mention some of his qualities. For example, you may say teacher. Sometimes you may say Ali. Who is the teacher? But there's a difference between calling him Ali and calling him teacher. When you say teacher, you are just talking about one aspect of him. But when you say Ali, you refer to the essence of that person. Thank you. Are there any questions from the gents? Salaam alaikum, Sheikh. Salaam alaikum. Sheikh, I just seek some clarification on one of the items that you touched upon when you explained about the essence of God being consistent with reality. And you mentioned uh, about you and I imagining a, a car in our heads and then never being able to collide. You speak loud. Sorry, you, 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 meant, you, you talked about you and I imagining a car yeah, yeah. and then not being able to collide yeah. because that could never happen. But then both of us in our imaginations are imagining a car. So within our individual imaginations, they exist. Yeah. So in the same way, you said that there couldn't be two gods with with that. Uh, with, they could be in... But what the question arises in my mind is, would that not raise the possibility of there being another singularity which is consistent with its own environment, which we are not aware of? Yeah. What I was talking about was that if there were other gods they would have had their own territories and there could have been no interaction between creatures of each of these gods and this is not the case about this world I was not in the uh, I didn't have the intention of proving the unity of God what, what I was saying that this world that we see is so interrelated and interconnected that cannot belong to different gods. As the Quran says, If there were other gods, different from one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then there would be mischief, there would be disorder. But there may be possibility of thinking that maybe there is another world that we don't know. To refute that, we use other arguments. For example, a very good argument that we can use is that if there is infinite being, the very concept of infinite being does not accept multitude, as I said about whiteness. Limited beings with different degrees of being, they can be compared to each other. They can be distinguished. But if you have being as such, 
being without modification, without any limit, then you cannot imagine two. And there are different other arguments also. So every argument can be used in its place. I recently, uh, one, some of the brothers uh, sent me an email about uh, Einstein that he said, uh, the email says that most of the people, when they see miracles, they think about God. Because miracles show that there must be someone, you know, behind this miracle. But for Einstein, the fact that there is no need for miracle to run this world was enough to believe in God. Because God has created the world in the way that there is no problem, no disorder. He doesn't need to every day come and intervene. Yes, sometimes in very exceptional cases, he may intervene in a special way. But normally, he has created the world with such an order and laws and regulations that if you look at the world, even if someone doesn't believe in God, still he can understand the way the world works. So this was the idea of Einstein, that without miracle, we understand that there must be God. Thank you, Sheikh. Is there a final question from the ladies? Um, you mentioned whatever actions we do on are, are not independent of Allah, but we are told that evil is an absence of goodness and not a creation of Allah. Is this a correct statement? Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, inshallah, I will talk about it when we talk about the issue of justice to talk about evil, for example, about bad things, whether these are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not. But just briefly, we should say that whatever exists, whatever exists, it has some level of goodness, because existence is identical with goodness. And this is why something can be created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But sometimes, this being may have bad effects for other things. Maybe these are fixed, maybe these are not fixed. But to judge whether the creation of this is good or not, you need to have full picture of the world. You cannot just point to one thing and say, what is the benefit of this? Like, for example, you know, if someone tells you, what is the benefit of having eyebrow? Okay, if the eyebrow is put in its own place, you can explain. But if they take eyebrow out of the context, just you know, in nowhere, you cannot explain what is the benefit of eyebrow. So it's very important that the creation of everything is taken in its context. Why we have murderers? Why we have criminals? Maybe you could think that it would be better if we didn't have these. But if we imagine that we need to have human beings with freedom, with free will, then out of this you may have a group of people who misuse their free will and they do mischief. Then you accept. But if you take it out of the context and just say, why Allah has created murderers? Okay, everyone will say, no, it was better if we didn't have murderers. So we need to put everything in its context. Thank you very much, Sheikh. If it's okay, we can stop there and everyone can proceed downstairs for namaz. Inshallah. Uh, just, uh, I should say, next week, I am not uh, in London. Inshallah, with your dua, I am in Toronto. But, uh,